Hey, just before we get started today, I want to remind you that we're going to partake of communion together. And so this is an opportunity to have you go and prepare those elements, get some uh, wine or some grape juice and some cracker or a piece of bread. And uh, in a few minutes today, we're going to take the time to stop everything else we're doing and just focus on the things the Lord is doing with us and for us in this time of communion together. And so we're glad you're here with us today. God bless you guys. We'll see you in a few minutes. Hi, everybody. As a body ministry coordinator here at Candlelight, I just want to take a moment to just give you an update. I know we're going through some really um, bizarre times with this COVID-19, and it's really impacting uh, everything we're doing in America, around the world. Uh, But I wanted you to know and give you an update and let you know that ultimately we know that God is gonna be glorified through everything that's going on. Now I wanna take a moment to give you an update as to what we're doing here at the church. First off, um, as you know, many of you know, um, I'm reaching out to several of you by phone, I'm calling you, and I just wanna see how you're doing, uh, see how your family's doing, and see if there's anything we can do as a church we can do for you to help you out in these difficult times. And so, It's been amazing. I've reached out to about 225 of you now. And so if I haven't contacted you yet, uh, I'm I'm in the process of doing it. So just please bear with me. It's it's a lot of phone calls. I enjoy hearing everybody's voice. I miss each and every one of you, um, but um, I just am having an amazing opportunity to to speak with each and every one of you one-on-one and really seeing how you're doing and the need that we have. And so thank you for being very kind in, in that. Um, some interesting things that I have found out in that time that I have called is one um, is that several of you are just telling me how much you are praying for us, the staff at the church, the church body, and all the other members. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to put that in your prayers. It really means a lot to us. Uh, also, um, what I've also found is that several of you are actually asking if there's something you could do for us, how you could help us. And I really appreciate that. We're, I'm balancing that with uh, the concern of what's going on with the virus. And so if I do have a need for any, any need in the church, trust me, I will reach out to several of you or a couple of you uh, that has that skill set and who can help in that way. But thank you very much for taking that time. Another thing that I have found out, which is just an absolute blessing, and I love to hear this, is that several of you have made, made, made sure to let me know that in this time you still are financially supporting the church and I love to hear that and it really means a lot that you guys in this time and not being physically in the church you're making sure that you're letting me know that you're doing that and that truly means a lot and I also with that in mind I also wanted to um, give all of you a uh, a special thank you from Kim and Terry who are the bookkeepers here they really want to thank you many of you who have written checks and uh, for your financial support when you send it in Um, You're writing, you're attaching little notes, just letting us, letting them know that you're praying for the church, praying for everybody here for for our health and everything. And they are so grateful. It really um, basically brings a tear to their eyes. And they they truly wanted me to reach out and tell every one of you, thank you so much. Another thing I have found also in that too is, this is on the the, the flip side of this, is that um, in several of these um, lists that I have and I'm calling you, I have found that some people's information, phone numbers, are no longer uh, working. So if you could do me a favor, if you could, if you know that you have changed your phone number and you're not certain if you've actually reached out to the church to let us know, please take the time to um, reach out to us. You can email us and let us know that you have changed your phone number. That way I can actually connect with you. We can connect with you. So I just want to make sure that we, um, we, we get, we, that you c- c- uh, fix that. Also, um, We just want you to know, I want you to know that we miss every one of you. Um, We we truly miss that in-person contact, being able to sit there and look you in the face, telling each and every one of you we love you, that we're praying for each and every one of you. So, you know, we just want you to know from from the church, from the staff, that we really miss you. We look forward to seeing you again. Only God knows that time that that's going to happen, but we are going to do everything that that we can do to help you to make sure that we're staying connected with you. And we just truly want you to know that we're praying for each and every one of you, that we love you, we miss you, 
And we know ultimately God's will be done and God will be glorified in all of this. Hi ladies, I'm just wanting to connect with you through this um, video and let you know how much I miss you. I love you, I hope you're all doing well in this shelter in place um, moments of our lives. Uh, I know the Lord has been doing a work in my heart. The first two weeks of this um, quarantine were very hard for me. Um, I'm a creature that loves my routines and um, those routines are gone. And now I am spending a lot of time in the Word, in prayer, and on the phone with those of you who would like to connect with me, please call me. My number is on the Candlelight website and you can also email me at brenda at candlelight.org. I would love to meet with you um, through Zoom. Uh, we have Facebook. We have so many ways to connect. They're calling this um, social distancing, but I call it physical distance. And so we can still stay connected. And now is the time to be practicing what we've been learning in our Bible studies. And this is that but God moment. Uh, we have other ways that we can minister to one another during this time of uh, physical distancing. Uh, we have some things that we had planned on our calendar that are going to be canceled due to this coronavirus. And so I'm sorry to announce that we will not be having our ladies tea at our regular time. But we are hoping to reschedule our tea for Christmas. That is our hope and we probably will be canceling our retreat also. Um, I still have a smidge of hope left that we would be able to still do the retreat, but stay tuned. I love you, and remember Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God will rule in your heart. Good morning, Candlelight family. It's a blessing to be with you again today. We have a lot to cover. We're excited about the day and um, trusting the Lord just in the midst of all the things that we're going through. I know that these things are hard for you. They're hard for me. But we are a people who are flexible. We are a people that trust the Lord. We're always looking to Him for the leadership and the guidance that He provides us. And I'm so thankful that we can do that together. And so today we're going to continue our study in 1 Peter. I'm going to be looking a bit with you into the book of Ephesians. But before we get started, I want to cover just one quick announcement. Hang tight when we get through the Bible study today, and then we're going to be having communion together. Uh, I want you to stay with us because we have something very special for the kids after the Bible study all the way down to the end of the service this morning. And so we don't want you to tune out when the Bible study is over. Put the kids around the TV, put the kids around the computer, and we'll be able to enjoy a little time with the kids today as well. So would you join me in prayer as we take a few moments just to seek the Lord and ask his guidance and his leadership in our time together today? Let's bow our hearts together, you guys. Lord, thank you so much for the blessing and the privilege that we have in the midst of these troublesome times to employ technology that we have computers, that we have iPhones or uh, smartphones, we have tablets and iPads, we have even smart TVs that allow us to join our hearts together, even though separated by some distance and by technology, we have our hearts knit together in your presence. And so, Lord, right now I'm just thinking about you. I'm thinking about your people. And coming before you, Lord, asking for a very special anointing upon your word today, in our hearts today, that you would enrich us, that you would allow us by your grace and by your power to grow and to employ the teachings of your word today in our everyday lives and in particular in our homes. I'm reminded of the fact that churches in the first century 
And as much as people began to come to faith in synagogues, in marketplaces, can't even help but think about those that were out in traveling locations, uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch come to mind, where they came to know you, but then they began to gather in homes. And right now, we all of us are gathering in our homes, and we're not allowed, as it were, to come into our buildings. And Lord, we recognize that this is something we're doing voluntarily in an effort to prevent the spread of this COVID-19. We know we have freedom. We know that you've given us freedom. But Lord, we voluntarily subject ourselves to this form of change so that we can show love to our neighbor, so that we can show love to the members of our own congregations, preventing them from being exposed to the potential of any kind of virus or sickness for the present time in this present distress. Lord, use this time for your purposes and for your glory. And Lord, allow us as we study the Bible to have our hearts open. Lord, that our minds would be receptive, that you would allow us to get away from our traditions that uh, might be in contradiction to your word. And Lord, as we do, mold us and make us to be a people of God that bring glory and honor to your name. And we thank you for it, Lord. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last few weeks, as we've been working our way through 1 Peter, I've found it very interesting and timely. And in particular today, as we begin to work our way through the latter part of chapter 2 and work our way into chapter 3, the timeliness of this lesson. Now, recognizing that we can talk about the political, we can talk about eschatology, Uh, We can talk about the present distress and how we're supposed to suffer. The focus that Peter brings to us at this point is about the ministries of the home, about our gathering together in our own little church, in our own little assembly within the framework of what we call that home or our house in which we abide with our children, uh, if we have grown children with our spouses and some even by themselves. And we're thinking about every one of you. We're thinking about all that you might be going through and all the crisis, the anxiety, the fear, uh, employment issues. We're thinking about the fact that there's a financial crisis for some of you, and we want to be here for you. We want to serve you. We want to help you, and we're equipped to do that. And so again, I remind you, if you have a need, contact us through hope at candlelight.org. But all that to be said... I've been thinking about the fact that there are many people processing many things at this present time and how it is important for us, how important it is for us to be able to give focus to the fact that there are people right now that are feeling sometimes even mistreated by employers. You've been laid off. You Uh, aren't going to have an income for a while. This is going to cause stress and anxiety and sometimes even bitterness or anger. You feel mistreated. I've been thinking about the fact that there's a lot of people that are feeling a sense of hopelessness. We've spent some time on that in our Wednesday studies, talking about the fact that we are not in the tribulation, and then looking at the climate, the spiritual climate, the signs of the times, and how those things relate in the Bible to where we are on that timeline. And I know that there are so many people, as mentioned Wednesday, whose hearts are overcome with fear and how that we have those persons that the Bible talks about whose hearts will fail them for fear. But I'm also aware of the fact that there's a lot of people today that are suffering with the temptation of suicide. I was looking at some national statistics today. And as I looked at those, I recognized that Idaho is the number five nation, uh, or it's number five state in our nation, statistically, for suicide. And I can't help but think about hopelessness. I can't help but think about the things that people are going through. And Now, Candlelight family, I know that you have hope in the Lord. 
But there's so many people watching this stream today. There's so many people that will watch this later that may not know the hope that we have. And I want to talk to them for a moment. If you're feeling hopeless, if you're feeling anxiety, if you're feeling fear, if you're feeling frustration, we want to be there for you. And the Lord provides us that hope. He provides us the ability to come before him and be built up in the inner man, in the spiritual man, and that we are given that vision for a new day that he has provided for us. And I want you to know that. And all of us as members of Candlelight, all of us that are members of the body of Christ, we have that hope and we want that hope to well up within us. Even believers at times become a little overwhelmed with fear and anxiety and stress. Sometimes even have that temptation to end their lives. And guys, this is not what we want to do. Family, this is not what we want to do. We want so desperately to cling to the Lord. And so all of these things relate to our personal lives at the moment. It relates to the things that are happening in our own families at the moment. We've also been seeing some rising tension in marriages. Uh, If you're trapped at home with your spouse, and I know that some people have been making jokes about this, Uh, For me, I'm so thankful, I'm so blessed, because Brenda and I get along so well. But I know that when you're not together 24-7, and then all of a sudden you're forced together 24-7, sometimes that can provide a little tension. And the Lord addresses those things in the Word. The Lord gives us some marching orders for the role of a wife, and the role of the husband, and the role of children. And that's sort of where Peter is taking us in this particular part of our journey through this first epistle. And we do need to deal with the idea of employment and employers. Uh, the, The Bible refers to the employee in some cases as servants and the employer in some cases as masters. Then you have that role of husband and wife and all the dealings with the children and the role of children and respect for their parents. Every one of these things is dealt with in the Bible. And so we want to deal with those today. Now, I realize that these are going to be tense conversations for some of you. The idea of the husband being head of the wife as Christ is head of the church and the wife submitting to her husband and children obeying their parents is something that is a little foreign to the Western mind, to the unregenerated mind, to the worldly mind. But these are biblical principles that we must adhere to if we're going to have genuine harmony in our homes. And so today, I want to start in Ephesians. Now, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. And we're going to read all the way through chapter 6, verse 11. And I'm doing this to set us up for the things that Peter's going to be addressing. And then I've got about eight points in conclusion today that I hope will help bring some focus to all these things, apart from just the expository style teaching that we're used to. And so let us begin reading Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil can't help but think about the fact that there are so many people today that are disputing, analyzing, uh, even bringing to computational uh, conclusion some of the things that are happening today and that there are some out there that are trying to help us and others that are trying to capitalize on the crisis that we're in. And some of the people out there are evil. This is an evil time. And there are some people that will manipulate and use these things to their own advantage. But we are called to redeem the time because the days are indeed evil. Verse 17, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. I heard just today that there's a run on alcohol now, and uh, I was talking to my son Joel about this. Uh, He is saying that people are uh, replacing alcohol for toilet paper. I don't know why they would think to do that. Now the rush on toilet paper is starting to subside and now people are taking a rush on the liquor store and the wine cabinets and the beer closets or wherever it is. 
And you know what, guys? I'm one of those individuals. I don't believe that it's a sin to have a drink, but I do believe it is a sin to be drunk. And I want to remind you that these times that we're to redeem, these evil times that we're to redeem, are times in which we do not need to be drunk. We do not need to be drunk with beer. We don't need to be drunk with wine. We don't need to be drunk with mixed drinks or straight hard alcohol. We need to be sober-minded in these times. And someone said, well, that's because they have nothing to do. They're sitting at home. I'd prefer to see you reading your Bible, spending time in prayer, redeeming the time, calling a friend. We've talked to you about this already, calling five friends, five people in the church, five of your distant family members, five of your closer family members, and ministering to them and seeing how they're doing. Redeem the time for the days are evil, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, foolish behavior, but be filled with the Spirit, be being filled with with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Just this week, we were able to watch a short video of our youngest granddaughter uh, who was worshiping the Lord with her hands raised in the air and her eyes closed and just ministering to the Lord in her home with her mom and dad and her siblings. And what a joy it brought to me. What a joy it brought to Brenda. We both listened and watched that and it just brought tears to our eyes. That's what we should be doing, spending time in worship, spending time with the Lord in prayer and opening the Bible together and allowing the Lord to fill us up in the heart. And giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks always for all things. Wow. Are we giving thanks for these times? We've already talked about the fact that we know that all things work together for good. But now, as Paul told the Thessalonians and now here in Ephesians, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another in the fear of God. Don't be resistant toward one another. Care for one another. Love one another with a pure heart, as we've covered. And then Paul begins this discussion about the home, the same kind of discussion that Peter will be giving those that are scattered all over northern Turkey. In this case, he says, wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, in this context, everything means everything in relationship to those items, those rules that method of living that God has commanded. If the husband tells his wife to go rob a bank, obviously, women, you don't have to do that. But in everything in the Lord, as we are called upon for the wives to submit to their own husbands in the Lord, verse 22. Now, guys, I know this is uncomfortable. Uh, gals, I know this is uncomfortable. Um, these are things that are not commonly talked about much anymore, especially with feminism on the rise and with so many differing opinions. And I want to encourage you with this word today, as we work our way through this, to recognize these aren't my words. This is not my opinion. This is not the opinion of those in your home. This is the opinion of God. Now, I would trust that it becomes my opinion and it becomes your opinion. It becomes the opinion of your home because we are those who will walk in diligence before the Lord, always trusting the Lord and fully surrender to him and submit to him, provide no resistance to the things of the Lord. And so let's just take the time to let the Lord minister to us and not allow ourselves to become defensive during a process that we'll go through this morning. So wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. And then he goes into verse 25. I love this because inasmuch as the wife is called to be submissive to her husband, the onus is upon the man in his leadership. 
in so many ways. And I just don't want any man thinking, yeah, woman, you better obey me. Uh, and, and I don't want the women to be telling her husband how he's to lead or how he's to live. Let us listen to the context. When Paul writes, wives submit, he's not telling husband, tell your wife to submit. And when he says husbands, he's not telling wives to tell their husbands. He is addressing them first person, wives and then husbands. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, if you will, let's just back up for a minute, and I want to just point something out briefly in verse 27, that he might present her to himself, that he might present her to himself. Now, this is in reference to Christ cleaning his church, preparing his church, making his church spotless and without blemish, that he might, Christ might, present her to himself. But the principle that Paul is laying down here is the ministry of Christ to the church and in the way that he puts this, the ministry of the husband to his wife. And I love that. And so husbands, invest in your wives, love your wives, lay down your lives for your wives, lead as Christ leads his church. Now he goes on in this discussion on the home and the management of the home, talking to children. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That alludes back to the times of the old covenant when discipline was quite severe on children who would curse father or mother or be disobedient. Uh, It's a very serious matter. And young people, we need to be obedient and respectful and honorable toward our parents. Now you fathers, verse 4, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Then he moves on to the servants, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters. Now, in some ways, we could apply this to the employee-employer relationship. We do know that there was slavery in biblical times. There's still slavery in parts of the world. We personally dislike slavery altogether, and uh, I think you probably know that. However, in this context, there is still in our Western culture, in our Western world, the bondservant, as it were, the employee, and then the employer relationship. And so let's put that kind of as a focus on these things. Bondservants or employees, be obedient to those who are your masters or employers. According to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ. So in other words, if you're working for someone else, work as if you're working for Christ. Uh, If you're laying carpet, you're laying that carpet in God's house. Uh, If you're working in any kind of environment, let a stewardship be upon you so that you would serve your employer as you would serve the Lord. And then he goes on to say, not with eye service as men pleasers. In other words, not just when they're looking, even when they're not looking. Those of you that are assigned to work from home right now, and many people are, uh, don't count down your hours and, and say, well, I worked five hours today knowing that you've been watching soap operas for half the time. By the way, turn off the soap opera. 
Uh, but in this context, not with eye service, in other words, not just when they're able to look at you or not when you think they're looking at you, but uh, don't be men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, employers, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Now, I'm sure that we can all bring application to this in so many ways, but let us just think these things through and let them resonate with us. Let us be the people of God that serve with such integrity that our testimony shines to the glory of God. And then in verse 10 and 11, and then we'll follow over to 1 Peter, we read these words, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Don't trust in your own strength. Trust in the Lord. Let us look to the Lord for the resource that we need from within. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, Peter's been talking about the fleshliness and the fleshly mind and the carnal mind and those fleshly sins that war against the soul. And we know that the enemy of our souls would love to get us all in the flesh, get us panicking, get us worrying, get us self-serving, get us out of order in the home, having fighting within the home, having discord, lack of unity. And guys, gals, this is God calling us to walk in submission and harmony in him. So let's go over to 1 Peter as we have been working our way through this epistle and follow up on this based on what Peter is telling us in his epistle, telling those that he was writing to this group of individuals scattered around northern Turkey at that time in the first century. And certainly uh, this allows for great application for you and me. Following that same principle that we learned about in Ephesians, well, let's pick up in verse 17. I think I'd mentioned verse 18 earlier, but I'd like to start in verse 17 for our purposes. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And then verse 18 says, Servants, be submissive to your masters, with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Wow, that's a little tricky. That's a little difficult. But this is, Peter says, commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. And you might remember when I was bringing some introductory thought, that there are some of you that are going through a hard time right now. You're having some issues with the workplace. You're having issues even with your employer. You've been laid off. You're frustrated. You're fearful. I want you to just take these things to heart. We should be those persons that are good and gentle as employers and as employees, likewise the same, as he brings this in the context of the servant. Servants, be submissive. Don't provide resistance to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. And if you're an employer, I I encourage you, I exhort you, be kind, be compassionate, be understanding, and be helpful. Do all you can to support everyone that serves you and works alongside you and works for you. Here at Candlelight, we're keeping all of our staff going. Everybody is on their payroll. There's no one suffering financially. And I want to thank you, members of Candlelight, for your faithful support because you're the ones making this possible. They don't work for me. They work with me for all of us. 
We are a team, a family together. And in as much as God has called me to be the senior pastor, that does not mean that I am more gifted, more qualified. It just simply means God has put me in that office. And everyone that works here at Candlelight works together with me. And we are here to serve you. And thank you for giving us that privilege. It's such a joy. We're overwhelmed to be able to go through these difficult days and those easier days serving you based on the grace of God and the work of God through you. Continuing, verse 19, this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. So even in hard times, even in difficult times, we keep a good attitude. Verse 20 says, for what credit is it if you are beaten for your faults and you take it patiently? Now, really, I'm kind of frustrated with this particular translation. We do note that the word beaten is not altogether inappropriate, but really this word that's used here in the Greek is only used a couple of times in the New Testament. Uh, As best I know, it's never used in the Septuagint. And we have this interesting uh, translation, beaten, when it really means to be treated poorly or to receive ill treatment. Uh, We know about buffetings and those kinds of things in the scriptures, and we know about the phlegra, we know about uh, the, uh, the stripes that Jesus took upon himself, we know about the great sufferings that people have endured, slaves have endured, we've seen all this kind of thing, but this particular word doesn't focus there, but it does also allow for that. You'll see that as this comes up when we talk about the sufferings of Christ in just a moment. But what is really communicated in the Greek language here is that no matter what the extreme might be, from the smallest inconvenience or poor treatment to the greatest amount of suffering that might come upon you, do all that you do for the glory of God. Suffer righteously if you must suffer at all. And so what credit is it if you are beaten for your faults? You take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, verse 22, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And then verse 23, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. God's watching. God sees what's going on, you guys. God is the one that's got our back. All the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. We're going to be with him. This life is a vapor that appears for a moment and vanishes away. And I'm looking forward to being with the Lord. And I know you are too. Verse 24 says that he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, and now, but now, have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Could spend all day developing those couple of verses. But let me at least just mention this. He bore our sins in his own body, your sins and mine. If you don't know Jesus, today is the perfect day to say, Lord Jesus, you bore my sins for me. You took away my sin. You washed my sins, and I trust in you. And that he did this at Calvary. This is pointed out. On the tree is a a, a word picture that we have of Jesus being crucified on a wooden cross. That we, having died to sins then as believers coming to faith in Christ, and if you simply trust Christ, then this applies to you as well as it does to the longest living Christian mature believer among us. Having died to sins, we might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Now, we are spiritually healed and we're physically healed. I know that there are some people that will contend that this only relates to the spiritual healing, but I want you to know something. If you know Jesus, when you get to heaven, you will 
experience a physical healing, a perfect healing, and you'll never be sick again. Now, the Bible does not promise that we're going to have physical healing now, not in this time continuum. Miracles do happen. God can heal people. But we do know this. In the atonement is provided not just our spiritual healing, but our physical healing. Every one of us, we won't be afraid of COVID-19. We won't be afraid of SARS or MERS or cancer or heart disease or diabetes. We will have a perfect healed body. I'm looking forward to that. You were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He is the one watching. He is the one caring. He is the one leading. He is the one guiding, and we can trust in him. And in that way, moving forward, Peter continues, as did Paul, talking to husbands and wives. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, we read, Wives, likewise. Now, I want you to point, I want to point this out to you. When he says likewise, he's pointing back to something else. Verse 13 in chapter 2 says, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. We talked about that last week. And then he tells the wife to be submissive. He told the servants in verse 18 to be submissive. And so he's continuing a thought related to being a people who are surrendered to the Lord and don't provide resistance. And so in this context, when he says likewise, or wives likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Well, that's important because uh, women, you don't have to obey every man out there. This is not an Islamic uh, biblical passage. I mean, we're, the Bible is the Bible, and Islam and the Quran is a corrupted, wicked religion. And so much of the cultures of the Arab community and the, the Muslim community, uh, even parts of the Middle Eastern community and other parts of the world outside of those cultures have such a very poor view of women. And God is the one through the church age in the church and by the example of Christ that brings women to that place where they should be honored and loved and cared for. And we saw that in Ephesians and we see it here. He does still, nonetheless, provide an order in the home where husband is head of the wife and the wife is head of the children along with the husband and that there is a committed relationship to those wives in as managers of the home so there is an order in which god has given us this role to serve we'll come back to that in our points so when he says likewise wives or wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Now, there's two ways of looking at this, and I want to point out to you that I believe both are correct and both have application. First of all, even if some do not obey the word, meaning you have not, they, your husband has not chosen to obey the command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ without a word when your husband. Now, if the husband is a believer and you think that you're going to argue him into doing what you want him to do, the Bible condemns that. Uh, I will spare myself a lot of criticism right now by avoiding other passages of Scripture. Well, then no. You know me better than that. The Bible says it's better to dwell in the wilderness than in the house with a contentious woman. Uh, it's better to d dwell in the rooftops, etc. And guys, I want you to know, gals, I want you to know, the order and the, the purposes of God in these things is so that we have harmony and love in our homes. And it's not a matter of being abusive. It's not a matter of being less than. We'll cover that coming up. But women, I know that there are times that there's a temptation to argue. There's a temptation to become emotional or, or be aggressive. And I want you to just say, God, I commit this to you in Jesus' name. 
It doesn't mean you can't share with your husband in a gentle spirit. The Bible says a meek and a gentle and a quiet spirit is in the sight of God of great price. And yet, in this context, with that in mind, we have this injunction that even if some, that is some husbands, do not obey the word, whether it is because they're not believers or they are believers and they're walking in disobedience to God, they, that is the women, the wives, could and should without a word win their husbands. Let me read that to you again. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Ladies, I would far prefer to see you quietly go before the Lord and let the Lord be your mouthpiece. Let the Lord be the conviction that can come as he works with them than you trying to argue with your husband. Guys, I know, guys, I mean that literally, guys, men, I know that we're prideful. I know that we have a tendency to rise up. If our wives rise up against us, if they raise their tone, they have an attitude, uh, we want to be resistant. And ladies, I just want you to know this. If the man has pride issues, and we do, and if the man is walking in disobedience, and sometimes we do, the best thing you can do is go before the Lord and pray, trusting the Lord to bring conviction upon your husband. Believe me, his voice is stronger than yours. His opinion is better than yours. Uh, his enforcement is greater than yours. And ladies, please, let us trust the Lord and walk in humbleness in this way. And I want to remind you, men, I mentioned this when we were looking at Ephesians. It doesn't say, yeah, wife, obey me. It doesn't say, husband, tell your wife to obey you. It says, husband, love your wife. It says, wife, obey your husband. And let's keep those things in mind. I always hate it when I hear uh, some woman throwing out at her husband what he's supposed to be doing or some man throwing out at his wife what she's supposed to be doing. The Bible does not speak to this in the second person. It speaks directly to the wives and directly to the husbands, and may we keep that in mind. Now, reading back into context, wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, Reverence, do not let your adornment be merely outward, merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. I couldn't help but think about the fact that all the beauty parlors are shut down, the nail techs are shut down, the eyelash appointment places are shut down. I don't know what they call all these things, but, uh, you know, cosmetology and, and all this, this stuff that uh, ladies love to do. And frankly, I like it. I like it. Uh, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble this Sunday. I already know that, but I've made this comment many times. I say it tongue in cheek. I hope you'll take it that way, but I always figure, you know, if the barn needs painting, paint it. But, well, I hope you're laughing. But the thing is, let it not be merely the outward, but the inner man, the inner woman in this context that is the shining and most beautiful part of who you are. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, the word terror, I think, is a poor translation. Uh, it should read, really, 
uh, that they are, you, you are not terrified with any trepidation, with any fluttering, uh, with any sense of insecurity. And this means that you would have trust in your husband. This means that your husband is showing you the kind of leadership that will allow you to call him Lord, as it were, to be submissive to him and to walk in harmony as God has intended within the home. Now, he does not leave off with an exhortation to the wives alone, but now, as did Paul, he makes exhortation to the husbands, beginning in verse 7. Husbands, likewise. Now, we submit ourselves to God. We are called upon to submit to one another in the family context, not in the role of leadership, but in the sense of honor, in the sense of listening to each other and caring for one another and respecting each other. Now, we'll come back to that when we get to our points. But when he uses the term likewise, it harkens back to all these positions that are being taken in the Lord, submitting yourself to the Lord, husbands submit to the Lord, wife submit to the Lord, children submit to the Lord. And as we each one submit to the Lord, we will also fall into that perfect place of submission in the protocols of the family, husband, wife, children, uh, and then of course, a household employee or otherwise, as has been mentioned now twice in these two epistles. Husbands, speaking directly to them, likewise dwell with them, that is with your wife, with understanding. I think this is one of the hardest things for men. We don't want to hear it. You know, you're talking too long. Will you get to the point? Hey, be patient. Listen. Be a good listener. If your wife is venting, if she's talking, even if she's not talking in that meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price, we are called upon as men to be patient, to be compassionate, to be understanding uh, with our wives. Uh, it's been said, I don't know if it's true, that there are X number of words per day for a woman and X number of days uh, words per day for a man. And uh, by the time a lot of men get home from work, they've done talk themselves out. And the wives, a lot of times, uh, as being homemakers, keepers at home, as the Bible says in Titus chapter 2, uh, as they're raising children, a lot of times they just can't wait for the husband to get home so they can unload all the stuff that's in their heart, in their mind, whether it's stressful or joyful. Guys, be patient. Listen to your wife. Love her. Be kind and compassionate to her. Giving honor to her. Back in verse 7, husbands, likewise, dwelling with them, with your wives, with understanding. Giving honor to the wife. Respect her. Cherish her. Value her. Her price is far above rubies. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Now, this really is talking about, and ladies, please be patient. It's talking about a weaker physical frame, and that is typically true. Now, I've seen some women arm wrestlers. I've seen some women bodybuilders that, uh, frankly, I'd rather not meet on a dark alley. Uh, it's also talking about emotional weakness. Women have a tendency to be a little weaker emotionally Typically, typically, that's not always true. I'm not trying to stereotype. Women also have a tendency, according to the Bible, to be more easily deceived. And so when these things are taking place, we want to be understanding. We want to listen, men. We want to be cautious with them. We want to build them up. We want to allow them to share and listen to their hearts, not just their words. I've often told men and women in a counseling environment, don't listen to what I'm saying, listen to what I'm saying. In other words, don't use these words against me, try to hear my heart. And men, this is the best thing we can do, is try to hear your wife's heart. Open your heart to her and be understanding and give honor to her, value her as the weaker vessel. 
doesn't mean that they are inferior. Your wife is not inferior to you. She's not uh, less academic than you. Maybe your wife is a much more brilliant in IQ, in education than you. That's not what this is talking about. So guys, we should be willing to listen to our wives. We should be willing to, to glean from the things that God has taught them and that they've learned naturally. And believe you me, I will tell you I'm the first recipient of the fact that there have been many times that my wife shared something with me and I needed to hear it. Sometimes I didn't listen and I learned the hard way. And so guys, please be patient, be understanding, consider her, honor her as the weaker vessel and being heirs together of the grace of life. As a believer husband and as a believer wife, you are heirs together, heirs together. For in Christ, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile. Now, don't misunderstand that. Well, the Bible is not suggesting that there's no role differences. There is a place for a man to serve and there's a place for a woman to serve. There is a sense of subordination in the family, ordination and subordination. But that doesn't mean that the wife is inferior. And we should be very careful about that. Men, don't mistreat your wives. Don't belittle your wives. Don't make them feel small. Build them up. R women, please be patient with your husbands. We struggle with these things just like you struggle with your portion. And so we need each other. We need to be patient with each other and know that we are heirs together in the grace and of the grace of life. And then he's telling the husbands that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, there's a lot to be said there. Uh, I want to tell you that we could develop the idea that, uh, you know, if you got out with your wife, it's like you got that, all, that gift that you brought to the altar. And uh, the Bible says, Jesus speaking to those under the old covenant, if you bring your gift to the altar and you, there you find you have aught with your brother, leave your gift and go make yourself right with your brother. And then after you've been made right with your brother, come back and offer your gift at the altar. And so there's something to be said there. So if you have aught with your brother or sister, it can hinder your, hinder your prayer life. Uh, but also, let's, let's be real. I don't know about you guys, but if I have aught with my wife, if I'm upset with my wife, if my wife's upset with me, not only does it hinder my prayer life, it hinders everything. I feel like I'm unraveled until I can make peace with my wife because my wife is my number one church. My wife is my number one person. She's my best friend. She's everything in my life to me as the helpmate that God provided me, and I don't ever want to have aught with my wife. And so in this context, when he says, husbands, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together, that we would not have our prayers hindered. We don't want to do anything that's going to affect our interpersonal relationship with God. Now, God doesn't turn his back on us. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. But I don't know about you, but if things are going wrong, everything's bad, everything's all in a disheveled mess, I'm not really all that focused on the Lord. I'm usually way too focused on the problem at hand, and i got to fix it. And so let us work together to bring unity and harmony and love within the family. Verse 8, finally, all of you be of one mind. All of you be of one mind. Employer, employee, husband, wife, children. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another as brothers, love, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous. Oh, I love those words. I just want to stop and take the time to really think about that and let them resonate in our soul, in our spiritual persons. Compassion, others-centeredness, others-focused, compassion for one another, love as brothers. Whether we're talking about phileo love, the brotherly love, or agape, other-centered love, let us love one another with a pure heart, as we've discussed over and over again. Be tender-hearted in opposition to hard-hearted. 
It's so easy to carry around bitterness. It's so easy to carry around hardness, hurts, things that have been done, words that were spoken. Candlelight family, others that might be listening, is there anything between you and your wife, men? Is there anything between you and your husband, women? Is there anything between you and your parents, children? The Lord exhorts us to be tenderhearted and full of compassion and walk in love. Let us work toward healing. If there's something that needs to be said, say it in reverence, say it in peace, say it in joy. There are times when nothing needs to be said. We just forgive in Christ, for Christ's sake, even as God in Christ has forgiven us. Guys, you even know that there are things that we've never confessed to the Lord that he's already forgiven us for. And why do I say that? Well, I know that there are many things that we've done that we don't even know we've done. And if we don't know that we've done them, then we certainly can't confess them. And yet I know that we fall short. We always fall short of the glory of God. And so forgive one another. Be compassionate toward one another. Be tender-hearted. Let no root of bitterness overcome you and be courteous be thoughtful of others go out of your way to make space when i think of being courteous i think about moving aside if i see someone walking down the street opening the door for someone else waiting in line and saying go ahead of me always making space for others putting others in front of ourselves In verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Don't return evil for evil. Well, you should have seen the way that person looked at me. Or reviling for reviling. Somebody spoke evil at me. I'm going to fire right back. Hey, wait a minute. I have seen so much miscommunication in these things. I've seen so much intentional wrong. Well, they did me wrong, and I'm going to do them wrong too. No, no, no. That's not the disposition of a Christian. Moreover, I can tell you story after story of times, even here at Candlelight, when someone will become upset by the fact that somebody looked at me wrong. They scowled at me. It's happened to me, it's happened to my wife, where we were completely oblivious. We weren't looking at someone with scorn. We weren't looking at them with evil intent. Maybe we're focused. Maybe we're just thinking about something that's bothering us. Somebody's grieving. We just heard about a suicide or a death or someone diagnosed with sickness and we have a look on our face. And that, if it's happened to me, if it's happened to Brenda, I know it's happened to you. And if it's happened to you, Please don't be judgmental. Don't immediately assume the worst. I know personally, if I've been in a restaurant and I think the the server has an attitude, I almost said waitress. I shouldn't say that anymore. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that maybe they're having a bad day instead of what they're not doing for me. Boy, that server sure hasn't brought me any coffee. I can't believe the server looked right at me. It was like she was looking right through me. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe we should be saying, how are you doing today? What can we do to serve you? How can we make your day better? Let us be those kind of people, especially now in the times in which we're living. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit, citing from the Old Testament several passages as Peter loves to do. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. I love that expression. Let him seek peace. I'm looking around for how I can find it. And once I spot it, pursue it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about seeking it, and then seeing it, and when I see it, then pursuing it, I can't help but think of myself as running down the street, chasing it down, 
And when I finally get to it, I grab it around the waist and tackle it to the ground and um, bring it into subjection to me. I want that peace. I want to know that glorious peace. I know you want to know that glorious peace. And so look for that peace in the word. Look for that peace in the Lord. Look for that peace through prayer and run after it and tackle it and take it down and make it your own. It is what God intends for you. And especially in times like these. And finally in verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. You're not righteous because of how good you are or what you've done. You are righteous by the blood of Jesus, through faith alone in Christ alone. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. That means you, believer, candlelight family, anyone else listening, if you've trusted Christ, you are righteous. And I ask this question all the time, how righteous is God? And everyone answers, well, he's 100% righteous. And if you have been made the righteousness of God in him, that means you are 100% righteous in him already. Rest in that righteousness, not your performance in his. And then his ears are open to their prayers. We are a people that go before the Lord in prayer, in obedience, in surrender, trusting him, seeking him out for all those things that he intends for us. But Peter then brings this balance in this final thought, and then we'll get into our points, and then in a few moments we're going to share communion together. But we see this. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, oftentimes in the Bible, when we have the expression face, it really is referring to the presence. The very presence of the Lord is against those who do evil. They have an intentional to do wrong. Now, in this context, he's not talking about the regenerate. He's talking about the unregenerate, those that have not been born again. Even Christians sometimes can do evil, and the Lord loves you enough that he will walk in contradiction to you to bring you into subjection. He will chastise you. That's the blessed misery. The believer that uh, has genuinely been born again, the person that has the Holy Spirit residing with them, if you go out and walk in disobedience, you're miserable. That's the blessed misery. I love it because it's just an indication that you're actually saved. But to the unregenerated, those who do evil, unrestrained, happily do evil, the Lord is against them. And if that's you, the Lord is against you. And you don't want to be an enemy of God. You want to be at peace with God. And if we have peace with God, then we will have rest in these days. We won't be thinking with anxiety and fear, trepidation. We can trust him even in our finances. The Lord is the one with a cattle on a thousand hills. He'll take care of us. We won't want to end our lives. We will say, Lord, I want to give you my life and live for you. I want everything that I am to belong to you. You're all that I need. And let that be your prayer today. That You would say, Lord, you are the one I want. You're all that I want. You're all that I need. Now, before we have communion together today, I want to just go over a few points with you. I put together eight points, and I recognize that we've been taking some time here today in this Bible study. One of the things that is happening for me is that I'm not compelled by the clock. Maybe you've noticed that. We don't have a children's department full of hundreds of kids. We don't have all kinds of people that we have to hurry in and hurry out through the parking lot and the lobby. And so here we are. We have this time to really develop these things and think about them and allow the Lord to minister to our spirits, to minister in our soul. And so let's work through these points. It's sort of in summary, uh, but I think that these things will be important. You can take notes later. And by the way, 
If you're watching this on YouTube, you can scroll back and forth on your screen. So if you're at the beginning uh, of the, the lesson, you can scroll forward if it's been playing for a while. Uh, or if you've missed something, you can scroll back to the beginning and start it over. And we're going to try to keep this available at candlelight.org on our website under watch and listen, that big screen that you see, that's the YouTube channel. And so you can scroll back to the beginning after the service is over. If you come in right on time, that's fine. If you come in late, you always have these options. And then down below that larger window, you'll note some other smaller boxes. Those are dated. Those are the previous lessons. So if you miss something, you can go back and see those as well. Now let's work our way through these points. Number one, servants, husbands, and wives are called to live in biblical harmony with the Word of God for the purposes of healthy living and a godly testimony. Develop unity. And so whether it's the role of servant or husband or wife, if we walk in the biblical protocols, in the biblical subjections, in that submission to God and to one another, in the fear of God, and husbands loving their wives, and wives submitting to their husbands, and children submitting to their parents, we will develop an amazing and godly testimony that this world needs to see. So work on the development of unity in your home. Your home is your church, men. We'll talk about that. Number two, Men, the onus is on us. That means the responsibility is upon us. If we love and lead like Christ, who loves his church, our wives and our children will have an easier time following the leader. That's you. Lead like Jesus. And so this injunction's for the men. The onus is on us. Lead like Jesus, love like Jesus. It makes it so much easier. I can tell you this, if I'm walking in harmony with the Lord and I'm leading my wife, my wife has no problem following my lead. If I get off base, I get in the flesh, I start doing the things that I shouldn't be doing, boy, if you can believe it's gonna be a lot more difficult for her to lead. If I mistreat her, if I belittle her, it makes it a lot more difficult. Now, she still has that responsibility that will come up as mentioned in our earlier text and in our points as well. But guys, lead like Jesus. Number three, also for the men. Men, listen to your wife even as Christ listens to his church. Now, love your wife as Christ loved the church, but listen to your wife even as Christ listens to his church. Then answer her prayers, quote, prayers, unquote, and lead with the wisdom God provides. So weigh in. Let your wife weigh in. Think about it. Pray about it. Care for her. Let her vent. Let her unload. Let her share with you. Listen to your wife and answer her, quote, prayers, in quote. Now, as you know, as believers, sometimes we ask the Lord for things and he says no. You might have that same responsibility, but listen to her. Listen to her heart before you make those final decisions. And then know this, you are accountable for the decisions and responsibilities. So men, you are accountable for your home. If you acquiesce to the leadership of your wife and she's wrong, you still answer for it. Men, you can't just say, well, my wife is stronger than me. She's more opinionated than me. I'm just going to let her lead. No, God will not accept that. We men are accountable for the decisions and the responsibilities. We are held accountable before the Lord. Now, a couple of points for the women. Number four, women, submission equates to a non-resistance. So, in effect, if your husband is leading and you are resisting him, that is a lack of submission. So share, communicate, ask questions. I always tell people, by the way, 
If you are in a debate, if you're in a situation that is getting tense, stop, pause, remember that a soft answer turns away wrath, and ask questions. Do you mind if I share what I'm thinking? Do you mind if I share an alternate opinion? Would you be willing to listen to me? And when we ask questions, guys and gals, I want you to know this. When you ask questions, it just sets people at ease. When you're aggressive and you're pushing things down their throats, doesn't matter who it is, a neighbor, a friend, a family member, a husband, a wife, we tend to put up a boundary. We want to put up a a wall. But when we ask questions, we're inviting information. And so, guys, gals, ask questions. So submission equates to non-resistance. If your husbands are disobedient to the word, you are not put in the lead by default and should not try to play Holy Spirit. Boy, I realize how difficult some of this is to hear in our Western world, our liberal world, our you know, uh, uh, world that has gotten so far away from the biblical manners. But now, let me say that to you again so you can understand this. If your husbands are disobedient to the word, if your husband, singular, is disobedient to the word, you are not to put, you are not put in the lead by default. So you say, well, my husband's not obeying God, so I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do my own thing. Uh, look, there's a time and a place where you might need to be in submissive or you might need to be disobedient to your husband if your husband is literally commanding you to do something that you should not be doing. It's the same thing that we were talking about the other day within the framework of government. We are called to be submissive to our government unless the government is asking us to disobey God, commanding us to disobey God, then we can say no. Same thing applies in the protocols of the home. So if your husbands are disobedient to the word, you are not put in the lead by default and should not try to play Holy Spirit. Just pray and let God be God. How many of you know that God does not need your help? Do you know something else? This is a, this one blows my mind. I gotta, I gotta share this with you. A friend of mine once asked me, he says, does God need to try to get our attention? And I thought, well, that's an interesting question. Does God need to try to get our attention? We think about the expression today with all the stuff going on. Uh, Wednesday night, we had an earthquake. Uh, We're talking about pestilence. We're talking about famine and locusts and plagues and floods and the stuff that's going on. And I've heard so many people say, God's trying to get our attention. Listen, God doesn't have to try. God will get our attention. Uh, He will do it in any way he sees fit. Uh, I'm reminded of Paul the Apostle, formerly known as Saul, on the road to Damascus. God got his attention. So in the same way, you don't have to help God. Ladies, you don't have to help God. You don't have to play Holy Spirit. Trust the Lord. Pray. Let God get your husband's attention. He doesn't have to try. It's not like God's going to be inconvenienced. He's asking you to obey him, and then he'll deal with your husband if he is walking in disobedience. Trust me, I've seen it too many times. Number five, also for the women. Women, the secondary role you are called to does not suggest a lack of intelligent or lesser giftedness. So simply by virtue of the right protocols, It's the same thing that you might see in a military or a police force or uh, somewhere where there's military protocol or police protocol or fire department protocols. Uh, There's different levels of command. That doesn't mean that a subordinate person is more foolish or unlearned or stupid. It just simply means that there's a a role and a protocol. Now, personally, I believe that God put men in the lead so that he can protect his wife, shelter his wife. He doesn't have his wife out in the front taking all the fiery darts. The man is out there in the lead to protect his wife. Oftentimes, I'll tell Brenda, stay in the bunker. Uh, Let me handle this one. Because there is times in which the man wants to protect his wife and the protocols are good. It doesn't mean that you're less intelligent or that you have a lesser giftedness. I know that Brenda has great discernment. I 
have so many times been looking at circumstances and situations and people and things that are going on, and I'll say, well, I think we should do this. And Brenda will share something with me and tell me that, man, I really have a discernment about this. And there have been times I've listened and times I haven't. And believe me, there's a time that I should be listening. And so again, as I mentioned before, men, listen to your wives, weigh in, answer her prayers, quote unquote, and then make a decision knowing that you're accountable to the Lord for the decision, even if the decision is different than your wife uh, would desire. Make the decision, but weigh in and be aware of the giftedness and the person of the Holy Spirit that is in your helpmate and let her help you. Lovingly share with your husband and trust the Lord for the outcome. Lovingly share. Now, this is part of number five. Women, the secondary role you are called to does not suggest a lack of intelligent or lesser giftedness, lovingly share with your husband and trust the Lord for the outcome. And so you just trust the Lord as you communicate your thoughts and you pray. Don't try to be the Holy Spirit. Number six, parents, don't teach your children to do as you say and fail to do what you teach. Let me read that again. Parents, don't teach your children to do as you say and fail to do what you teach. The parent that says, hey, you shouldn't be smoking weed, and then you're sneaking around the barn smoking some weed yourself, come on, that's just hypocrisy. Whatever it is that you're teaching your children to do, you walk in that same harmony. Think about that in everything we do. Put your children in an environment where they can learn by watching you. Paul the Apostle said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So Paul imitated Christ, and then he tells the disciples, imitate me. Now that's an amazing thing for Paul the Apostle to say. If you live your life the way I live mine, you'll be pleasing to God. Wow, that is an amazing thing to say. And parent, I pray for you. I pray for myself. I pray for my wife that we will always live our lives in such a way that if our children emulate our lives, if they imitate our lives, that they will be pleasing to the Lord. Lead by example. Number seven, men, remember that the church you pastor resides in your home. Serve as priests, not just as king. It's easy for men to be king. I'm the man of my house. I jokingly always say, I'm the man of my house and I have my wife's permission to say so. But I want you to remember something. You are the king of your house. But more importantly, you are the priest of your house. You stand before your family and before the Lord as a mediator in a sense. You are the priest to your home, the pastor to your home. I have to tell you something. You guys have been thinking so much about this. The church began in the home. If we read through the New Testament, we talk about the home. Uh, Do not let them into your house or bid them Godspeed. Why does this expression come out? Talking about false teachers, don't let them into your house. Because churches in the earliest development met in homes. In, uh, I think it's in uh, Jude, can't remember right away. Uh, th- there's a reference directly to a church meeting in the house. Greet those that are in your house. And with this in mind, maybe it's Titus, I can't recall. I think it's Titus now that I think about it. The church met in homes and then it developed into structures and buildings. And by the way, people say there was no church structures and no church buildings in the first century, but there are, there were. We found the uh, through archaeological study, uh, churches, first century churches, second, third, fourth, and so forth. There's nothing wrong with meeting in buildings and nothing wrong with corporately gathering together. But first and foremost, know this, the church is in your house. Man, Husband, you are the priest of your home. You're the pastor of your family. And so don't serve as simply as king. (laughs) Serve as priest. You are the king of your home. Yeah, we know it. Uh, And everyone's looking at the husbands. Yeah, we know it. We've heard. Remember this. We serve like our king, like Christ. 
He is our King of kings. He is Lord of lords. Sarah called Abraham Lord. But yeah, I want you guys to know this. Men, remember that the church you pastor resides in your home. Serve as priest, not just king. And finally, number eight, believers, so all of you, finally, my brethren, all of you, as we read, believers, develop unity in the spirit. And if you must error, error on the side of grace. I recognize that in my life, this has not always been a surefire and true, perfect style of leadership. I've erred on the side of grace many times. But I still will tell you this, if I must error, I want to error on the side of grace. That doesn't mean I want to error at all. I don't. I want to do good. I want to make right decisions. I want to lead faithfully. But if I must error, I would error on the side of grace rather than being harsh or judgmental or suspicious. I don't make decisions based on my discernment, based on my insightfulness. I make decisions on facts. And it's important that we do this. Don't make assumptions. Even if something looks so clear, we must be very, very careful in our decision process. And if we must error, error on the side of grace. And so today, let's pray. Let's go before the Lord in closing these moments. And then we're going to allow you to prepare very quickly, if you haven't already, your communion elements, and we're going to take communion together. I'm going to bring Brenda in, and she and I will share together, I serving as priest of our home, and you guys at the same. Men, this is a great opportunity, such a great opportunity. If you don't have that time of the day where you pray with your spouse, you pray with your kids, this is a good time to develop it. Church begins in the home. And if God can bring about so many great things through this COVID-19 tragedy, we've already seen so many people hearing the gospel, so many more people watching online. If God can be doing all those good things outside of the home, think about the good things he can do inside of the home. May the Lord give us his power and grace to have holy homes and men that you serve as priests and kings and women that you honor your husband, respect your husband, obey your husband without resistance, submission. Children, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. See good days. Depart from evil. Don't be resistant to the leadership of your parents. Let them teach you by their example and by their words. And parents, let your words and your life walk match. And every one of us, if we must err, let us err on the side of grace with each other in our homes as we join around the Lord's table together today. And let us pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Nourish us, equip us, build us up, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, gals, we'll be back in just a moment and we'll prepare to share communion together. I'm bringing Brenda in. Let's have a special time. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. You know, it's times like this that we have to make provisions for change. And one of those things that we are changing at the moment is the need to have communion together in our homes. And so it's important for us to still maintain that custom that we have always embraced here at Candlelight in having communion together on the first Sunday of the month. And that happens to be today. But in this case, there's so much that we can focus 
And I think that it's important for us to consider the fact that we can be together with our spouse, our family. We can come together around the Lord's table and we can enjoy the opportunity to partake of these elements, the bread and the wine, in remembrance of the Lord's death. Now, when we think about the custom of coming together and enjoying a meal together, we do know that the Lord broke bread with his disciples and said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and they drank of it. They drank of it together. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, when we saw that kind of custom taking place, especially in the East, it was a way of the disciples with the Lord coming together as one. And in as much as you're at home today and we're here in the studio, we still can celebrate that real oneness that we have with each other, even in our separate environments. And so as you're at home today and as you're gathering around the Lord's table with your family, And as Brent and I are here together, enjoying this opportunity together with you, we want you to know that you're loved and you're with us in spirit. I'm reminded of Paul the Apostle's words when he said, though I'm absent from you physically, I am with you in spirit. And I know that's true for Brent and I with you. And I also know it's true with the Lord. The Lord meets us wherever we are. And so he's there with you in your living room, in your kitchen, wherever it is that you're joining us and he's with us here today. And so let's join our hearts together as we pray, and then we'll partake of these elements together. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege and the blessing of allowing for opportunities like this and teaching us about flexibility. We recognize the need for that flexibility right now in such a critical time in our community and in our world. I'm also reminded, Lord, that where two or more are gathered together, there you are. And as Brenda and I are gathering our hearts together today before you and with others that are watching online and participating with us online, we know that you're creating a unique unity in the body of Christ. We're so thankful for that. And Lord, we're experiencing miracles during this period of time. We're experiencing that divine protection. We're experiencing that divine presence of your comfort and your peace. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this privilege of gathering together. Even though we are separated physically, we are one body in one Lord and one Savior. And Lord Jesus, we remember that you took bread and you broke it and you told your disciples, take this bread and eat it in remembrance of me. That this bread represents your body and that you took the sins of the entire world in your body on the tree. And so, Lord, today, Brent and I take these pieces of bread in our hands and we will partake together as we remember your death and the sufferings that you endured for us. And as well, with those that are at home today, we eat this bread together in your name. Lord, we're also reminded that you took a cup And you said that this cup is the new covenant in your blood. The ramifications of that are amazing. Considering the blood of bulls and goats from the old covenant that could never take away sin, and considering the fact that you have a future plan and restoration for Israel when you come again, when they will fully experience the new covenant. But today, we as believers, both Jew and Gentile alike, become recipients of that cleansing of sin, the fact that you write your law into our hearts. And Lord, we're so thankful for that, that our sins and our lawless deeds are remembered no more because of your shed blood. We read in your word that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And Lord, we're thankful for that cleansing. It is your cleansed offering It is your perfect offering. It is your willing sacrifice. It is your shed blood that provides for all of our needs and the washing away of all of our sin and the remembrance of those sins no more. No future condemnatory judgment, only glory to come. 
And so as we partake of this cup together, we do this in remembrance of your death and of your shed blood in celebration of what you have done for us in shedding your blood and in a reminder that you're coming again. And so we partake of this cup together in your name. And Father, we're so thankful. Thankful for the fact that you have told us in your word that the stripes that Jesus bore in his own body were for our healing. We recognize that there are many people that would suggest that that healing applies only to the eternal. But we believe that this healing provides for us both now and in the eternal. We know that there are many people that will be sick in this life and they will die. All of us suffer from viruses and flus and disease. And we have the hope of that eternal healing that you will provide us. But we also know that in the atonement, you have provided miraculous gifts. Lord, one of the gifts of the Spirit, as is recorded for us in your word, is the gift of healing, the gift of the working of miracles, and Lord, the gift of faith. And today, as we are gathered in this way, we ask, Lord, that you would allow faith to well up within us, not something that we work up on our own, but the genuine intervention of your Spirit working in us by your power and providing us that great faith and trusting you during these times. And Lord, today, for those that are partaking with us, if they're at home sick, touch them and heal them, encourage them. If they're sick in their mind, if they're sick in their emotions, if they're sick in their spiritual life, bring them healing. And if they're sick in their physical bodies, Lord, provide by your grace, and by your power, divine miracles, and let us hear the testimony of your great work. And Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for you. We're so privileged to be yours, to be washed in your blood, to be bought with that price, the precious blood of Jesus. And we celebrate you today. And Father, we celebrate the divine work in the divine council that from before the foundations of the world, you promised and made this plan to come in the person of your son, Jesus Christ, God incarnate to suffer and die in our place for our sin, that by faith alone, in Christ alone, we can be saved. We celebrate that salvation today as a family of believers here and around the world. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Candlelight Kids. I miss you all so much and wish that I could give you hugs. I wish we were in the building together. I know this is a really frustrating time right now and that you can be discouraged and even confused. I hope that our message this morning encourages you. I am excited that we're going to be having our first online Sunday school together. So even though we can't be here in the building together, even though you're in your jammies, probably, and on your couches, we're still the body of Christ wherever we are. We're a family. This morning, one of our teachers, Mr. Bob, is going to be sharing with us about trusting Jesus, something that we can all use right now. But before we begin, I would like to bow our heads, focus on the Lord, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and ask for your wisdom and guidance. Prepare and open our hearts for the lesson this morning. We thank you for this time together to share in your word and fellowship with one another. Lord, not having a building doesn't mean we can't come together to worship you. And we thank you and praise you through all of this, for we know you are doing great things. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's get started. Well, hi guys and gals, boys and girls, moms and dads. It's Mr. Bob, 
and Buster, my special guest today. Wow, we have a special word for you today that we want to share with you. It's called the word trust. Yeah, and you know what? I found that in the Bible. Well, just in case you're not sure what trust means, Buster's going to help me. You see, when Buster gets up in the morning, you know what the first thing is that he wants to do? He wants to go outside. But Buster can't open the door, and we don't have a doggy door. So Buster has to trust me to let him out. And then I let him in, and you know what? The next thing he wants is his breakfast. Well, Buster can't get us breakfast, so Buster trusts me to get it for him. Well, after that, he can do anything he wants. Sometimes he takes a nap, but oftentimes he wants to play. But Buster can't play by himself. So I play with Buster and he trusts me to have fun with him. Well, there's one other thing that he likes to do a lot of times, and that's take a walk. But he can't take a walk by himself because he could get lost and another dog might come and chase him. So Buster trusts me to give him a walk. Oh, you know what? Buster trusts me for just about everything. And so here's the word trust. And to trust is to believe that someone is good, they're loyal, they're loving and caring, and they want the very best for you. Now that's cool about trust. Well now, I have a question for you. Who do you trust? Or you could say, who should you trust? You know, we're in some really, really crazy times right now. You can't go to school, you can't go to the movies, you can't go uh, shopping very well, and you can't get together with a bunch of kids and play or play sports. So this is a crazy time, and it's a good time to trust. So I found a Bible verse that really helps us. And that Bible verse is, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. And that's in the book of Proverbs, Verse, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Well now, let me break that down just a little bit for you to help you better understand that proverb. So, as you trust God with everything in your life, and as you keep your eyes and ears and thoughts on Jesus, and as you live for and seek to honor God in everything, you know what God's gonna do? God will lead you and guide you and direct you through each and every day of your life. And that's because He loves you and cares for you and wants the very best for you. So, let's go back through the verse again really quick. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Oh, couldn't get any better than that, could it? Oh, wait a second. One more thing. In all this craziness that's going on right now, we have another verse that ties right in with trust. And look and listen to this one. It says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. That means talk to God. Tell God your needs, your concerns, your problems. Tell God anything you want to tell Him, and He's going to answer. And don't forget to thank Him for His answers. Oh man, look, two verses. Trust in the Lord in Proverbs, and don't worry about anything, 
in Philippians 4, 6. Man, you have it made now. You don't have to worry. Things are going to work out and be good. And God wants the very best and loves you. Uh-oh. I see we're out of time. So, get your Bible out. Trust God. Read these verses. And it's all going to work out good. So, see you now. Hope to see you soon. Bye.